you. My name is Hyacinth Walters Olsen. I am the founder of Yud Consult and partner with Diversify for this initiative of diversity and inclusion in the workplace. We've been doing this program now for um, eight or nine months and it has been so phenomenal. The interaction has been great and the participation, the speakers that we've had in the lineup so far has been great and best of all has been um, the feedback from our beautiful participants who have found the content uh, valuable and have been in, able to initiate a lot of what they're learning from these talks. So um, before we carry on, um, just to let you know, this is not a um, performance. I'd like say this is a conversation. So please feel free to engage with us. We love as much feedback as possible. And that's in the comments. We will run a 90 minute session of which this is a part. Um, up until this session will go until 3 p.m. Uh, European time. We will run a 90 minute session and the last 30 minute session of this two hour session will be a Q and A. So please fire the questions at us. We uh, let's put our speakers under the spotlight and really get them to work today. <laughs> so before any further ado, may <clears throat> excuse me, may I ask our speakers to introduce themselves and I will start with Sarah. Sarah, could you let us know who you are, please? Of course. Hi, Hyacinth. Hi, everyone. Thanks for being here today. My name is Sarah. I work as the program director at Catalysts, an organization that run, runs mentoring programs for youth who recently arrived in Norway and does diversity consultancy towards uh, the corporate sector in Oslo and Norway. I'm excited to be here today to unpack some complex and not some so complex ideas, and I hope that I will provoke a little bit, and I hope that uh, you receive that as opportunities to learn. Wonderful. Thank you, Sarah. Sergio, we come to you. May you introduce yourself, please? Yes. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for, for being here today. Uh, my name is Sergio Prinsan, and I work as a uh, talent acquisition partner at Shipstead here in Oslo. Uh, focusing on tech um, tech roles, so so everything you know, software development, UX, product. I uh, have a big interest in, in people and and tech, and uh, working in in talent acquisition. So a, a lot of the things that we'll we'll be talking about today are very very relevant, um, you know, personally, but also things that that I that are part of my everyday work. So I'm really excited to hear what uh, yeah we're going to be talking about today and then hearing your thoughts as well in your Q&A later. Fantastic. Thank you, Sergio. And we come to Chisholm. May you introduce yourself, please? Hi, everyone. My name is Chisholm Udeze. I am an economist and I guess a uh, three times founder uh, of which Diversify is uh, one of them. Um, really passionate about uh, diversity and inclusion and just creating space for everyone to be seen and heard as they are. So I'm happy to be here and glad uh, uh, for uh, that Sarah and Sergio are here with us and I look forward to learning um, a lot from them, uh, from higher saints and also from uh, the participants. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Chisholm. Um, now, before I continue, just like to say Chisholm is also the founder of Diversify, and this is an initiative of Diversify. And we haven't done this previously, but if your company would be interested in sponsoring any of these events, please get in contact with Diversify. It would be really fantastic to have you on board. So we've had some pre-talks preparing for this event today. And Sarah, I would just like to come to you to ask you if you could um, just define the parameters of anti-racism and intersectionality for us today. And this will be the foundation that we'll be speaking from. Sure, yeah. Um, I mean, these are big concepts and, and uh, a lot of people imbue them with somewhat different meanings, but we realized that we were on uh, similar pages, at least, when we defined anti-racism as the active words towards freedom for everyone against racism, to work actively against the oppression that people experience. 
and very much informed by this idea that no one is free until all of us are free. And that also speaks to the intersectional dimension of this conversation. And by intersectionality, we mean the multiple identities that we possess as we move through the world. So as an example, that I have an identity as a woman, as a queer person, as a person from upper middle class backgrounds, uh, and so many more identities that impact how I experience the world and how people read me. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, I have pen in hand and I'm always eager writing notes as I go along. So if, you, if I take a few couple of seconds to respond after someone's spoken, it's because I'm furiously writing away and trying to look like I'm not writing. <laughs> um, so Chisa, I'm going to come to you and ask you, um, what bearing does, the, what relevance does intersectionality have on anti-racism? Thanks, Harrison. Um, so intersectionality was coined by uh, Professor Kimberly Crenshaw. I like to give credit where it's due uh, in 1989 to describe the ways in which race, gender, social class and other aspects of our identity overlap and interact with one another. You know, it mirrors the ways in which individuals simultaneously experience oppression and privilege in their daily lives you know, from an interpersonal and systemic perspective. So intersectionality mandates that we understand that parts of our identity does not work or exist in a silo or in a vacuum. Uh, intersectionality therefore provides a basis for understanding how these individual identity markers work with one, one another. So where relevance is concerned, uh, the relevance of intersectionality or anti-racism is an anti-racist intersectional frame that acknowledges the social consequences of race. Uh, it acknowledges that excluding racial analysis from any work allows racist systems, laws and policies to continue to operate within the status quo. It mandates the understanding that the impact of racial oppression is not fully realized without interrogating the intersections of all forms of oppression, be it based on class, you know, immigration status, or ability. So an anti-racist intersectional frame explores and analyzes how other forms of expressions are intertwined with and complicated by racial oppression. Thank you so much, Chisholm. Um, the part of uh, that description or the answer that jumped out to me was saying that the various parts of our identity do not exist in a silo. And I think we can all identify with that. I would just like to um, say to everybody as well, please feel free to use the reactions, the emoticons, if there's any, um, answer that you really particularly resonate with, then please feel free to show us that with the emoticons. So Sergio, I'm gonna to come to you now. <clears throat> and I'd like to ask you, what are the links between intersectionality and spatial relationships or spatial awareness? Yeah, so um, this is actually something that I've been thinking a lot about these, uh, this past year almost, uh, which is, this question of how do I enter a space, and it has a lot to do with with self awareness. So, you know, as as Sarah and Chisholm were um, were were saying, and 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 when it comes to intersectionality, you know, our identities are incredibly complex, and no one is just one thing, right? So, in some situations, we might be part of a dominant social group, while in others we can be part of a minority or a marginalized group, or even both in the same space, right? So depending on the situation, um, we might find ourselves in a position to either be in the forefront as one of the leading voices, uh, or maybe sitting back and amplifying other people's voices. Um, I want to, to present an example that illustrates this, uh, which is quite recent from you know, from the here, here in Norway, and um, there, there's an Instagram account called um, uh, Racism in Norway, and uh, a few months ago, 
they started a podcast uh, with the person who runs this account, uh, a black man and a friend of his who's a white woman. And there's some people took issue with that um, uh, because of the lack of representation of, um, you know, and when you have a podcast, you have an account called Racism in Norway, uh, one voice that should be included should be that of a, you know, a black woman who might be, who, who could be, you know, could give that, and again, back to this whole intersectionality of being, you know, being a woman, being black, being, so, so the, a lot of people, um, as I said, you know, the, the, the criticism came from that and how these conversations and, and the dialogues that, that could arise from, from such an arena, um, you know, but people thought that, or the impression was that it, they were quite limited, right? Because there are all these other um, stories, perspectives that are then not present. And, and again, right, when, when we understand the complexity of our identities, then, um, then that's what, you know, issues like this arise, I would say. Hmm. Thank you for that example, Sergio. In fact, if I recollect correctly, that sparked quite a huge debate, didn't it? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Um, and now, I actually, don't know. I, I checked the, the the. I think there's only one, there at least one episode, and I haven't seen uh, after that. So I don't know if they're maybe reconsidering or or um, what happened there. But but yeah, it's uh, definitely sparked some debate. Yeah, absolutely. I'm sure there's a lot of other people that would like to be included as well or represented as well. Mm. Um, so, Sarah, I'm going to come to you and I'm going to read this because it's quite a long question. So bear with me. OK, so is the opposite of racist, not racist? And I ask that because some scholars, most notably Ibram Kendi, notes that the true opposite of racist is anti-racist. So do you agree or disagree? And what does it actually take to consciously practice anti-racism? Did you get all of that? I, I think I did. Correct okay. me if I, I missed out on things. A little okay. tricky question though. Um, I think it's a question that makes people think about the semantics or like, what's the difference between not being not racist and, and being anti-racist? Isn't it both negations um, that you're like, not the positive form of the word like why what's the in the distinction here um and i i can understand why why people uh, question that and i think it does require that you grapple a little bit more with the the concepts or different understandings of the distinction between being not racist and being anti-racist and i know that um kendi he does make this distinction that when you are anti-racist you actively work against racism so it's not just uh, that you're not involved with it your step away it doesn't concern me but you take action to educate yourself or uh, identify acts that are going on around you or structures that are going on around you and take active measures to counter them um, and i think distinguishing yourself as an anti-racist compared to being not racist puts the onus uh, on you, or it places action on you, because uh, I think it, it, it is easy to say, I'm, I'm not racist, I'm just, I won't get involved with that. But then I think this is where the, the question of intersectionality comes up uh, by considering who can afford to say that, oh, I just, I, I'm not involved in that racist stuff, I'm not racist, but calling myself an anti-racist is a, is a strong thing because it prompts too much action from me and I'd prefer to not get involved in that. And I um, think that for some of us, it's it's comfortable to be able to say, oh, I just, I won't get involved with that. It doesn't concern me. And then I think we have to think, consider uh, what parts of our identities protect us from the functions of racism. What allows me to say that, you know what, I'm not gonna think about racism today. I'm just not gonna get involved in that. And it is because it won't strike down on me from some unknown place. Like I can walk down the street without the consequences of racism coming barreling at me. It's not a fear that I carry with me in my everyday, so I can afford to not actively fight against it every day for my own sake. But I think by assuming the identity of, of being anti-racist, you also consider all the ways in which your life, my life, is interlinked to other people's lives who do experience racist oppression every day. And it puts the onus on me to say, I have the capacity to work actively against racism. 
And therefore I do want to embrace this identity of being anti-racist because it demands something from me and it demands that I put something at risk and it demands that I put myself out there and that I do challenge the power that keeps racism in its place and that will have a cost. So it's uncomfortable, but it's a part of my identity that I want to assume. So I think in the mere distinction, it's taking action versus having just uh, opting out of it. And I think it's a challenge that we can bring to ourselves. So I would place myself in uh, Kendi's camp by saying that the true opposition of racism is to be anti-racist because you're actively working against something. But if you're not actively working against it, you your silence is consenting to it, or you're complicit in it. Great, thank you so much. And quite a few nods there and people agreeing. So some reactions there, which was fantastic. Um, and, you know, um, Sarifa was saying, you know, about just saying not racist is literally just sitting on the fence, um, as opposed to, like you said, uh, adopting the label of being an anti-racist, which demands a little bit more of you. Great, thank you guys for your participation. It's great to see all the comments in the chat um, and you know all the feedback from the participants, which is great. It tells me that you guys are actively listening and you're totally engaged, which is fantastic. So Chisholm, I'm gonna come to you now. And uh, some people believe that to be anti-racist or anti-racist, one must stand against all forms of bigotry. Okay, why is standing against other forms of bigotry in the workplace so essential, so essential to standing against racism? Thanks, Hyacinth. Um, first, I, I guess I should define what I understand as bigotry. I, I think it's probably a dictionary definition. It's prejudice against a person or group of people because of their membership to a particular group. So to me, it is counterintuitive. Now, now to me, it's absurd to be anti-racist without being anti-homophobia or anti-sexism, for example. It is a clear and present form of oppression of human beings for what, for what they are. There's no way to rationalize <laughs> one to be okay over the other. One of the primary ways to undo racism or any type of oppression is to constantly identify and describe and then dismantle it. Where anti-racism is concerned, you know, when you're a person of color, racism is often intertwined, complicated and worsened by other forms of oppression. Are you a black gay man from Africa? Are you a brown disabled trans woman? Are you a brown Muslim woman who wears the hijab? Are you a biracial indigenous queer non-binary person who's a single parent? How do you simplify the oppression any of these people face solely on one aspect of their identity? We must all keep in mind, you know, that racists and anti-racists are not fixed identities. We can be racist one minute and anti-racist the next. So my question to everyone here actually is, what does it mean to have to constantly reassert your identity as an anti-racist? In my opinion, none of us gets to just decide that, oh, I'm not a racist or I'm an anti-racist and be done with it. If you're working to check and dismantle sexism and homophobia, but are indifferent or silent in the face of racism or Islamophobia, then you've got work to do. So yes, I completely agree <laughs> that you must, you cannot be anti-racist and then pro-Islamophobia. That doesn't work, it doesn't make any sense. Yeah, I agree with you. Thank you again, everyone, for your participation in the chat. We will address your questions at the end. Um, thank you for all of your comments as well. Um, we will, uh, I'll read some of those out a little bit later. <clears throat> so just moving forward, sorry, I'm just really struggling today with allergies. So again, please bear with me. For those of you that joined late, I did say that earlier. Uh, so Sergio, coming to you, <clears throat> 
what does policy accountability look like in the workplace? I'm really interested to hear your perspective on this. So from a corporate perspective, how do you deal with situations involving racist behavior? Yeah, so I think um, one of the most important things to um, think about here is um, when it comes to, to when it comes to policies, right? One important aspect is is there an agreement between the top management and the rest of the organization, right? Are we um, uh, is there an alignment here? You know, why are these policies in place? Uh, how are they implemented? Uh, you know, if, if the business just sees them as something that you know we get from from the from leadership then it's going to be um, that accountability is, you know, it's not going to be quite quite there or, or in case of, you know, situations involving racist behavior, then they're either going to be, um, you know, handled in a very uh, kind of hish hish um, manner or either not handled at all or um, so one thing that I when, when I think about, you know, how to, how to deal with these situations, one, my, my opinion is that transparency is uh, the key here, right? Uh, I think in an example from my own experience from a previous employer where there was a situation involving a group of people that, that felt, you know, minorities feeling like they were facing discrimination in the workplace. And then uh, my employer used that opportunity to uh, review, you know, the, the, the policies that were in place uh, to, to get, and that's another thing, right? To use that opportunity to check in with the organization, get feedback, um, and then improve those policies uh, so that we make sure that next time, or to, to in, in case a situation like that arises, then those things are handled correctly because this is something that had been going on for a long time, right? So, and then from an employee's perspective, or or you know from from the organization, it's also being vocal about what can be improved, right? And uh, the more diverse the workforce is, the more, you know, the new, new perspectives come come up and, and um, situations where maybe the organization, you know, there are no pol policies in place because the organization, uh, there hasn't been anybody who has raised their hand and like, maybe we should do something about this, uh, or maybe there should be an accountability. Uh, people should be held accountable in situations like, you know, X, Y, or Z. So, um, and then I feel like as an, as, a, as an employer, then that's how you show your employees, um, people belonging to racial minorities that they're actually being, um, uh, that there the, their, their things, there's their policies in place to, to protect them and that, um, you know, when we talk about things like diversity and inclusion index or, you know, this and that, that it's not just, you know, empty talk, but that they're actually, you know, walking, walking the talk. Yes, I love that. Uh, too many organizations are not walking the talk. Um, but when you started there, I really love that you said, you know, is there an agreement between the, the top leadership and management, you know, um, and, and, you know, are companies actively reviewing policies and enforcing them, which is vital and key um, for this conversation. So, Sarah, are we coming back to you now, sitting rather comfortable there? We're going to come and disrupt your little corner of the world. Um, so, what pathways do you see, Sarah, for confronting racism in the workplace? And uh, what needs to be accounted for or considered in taking the approaches that you mentioned? Mm, that was a good question. Um, yeah, there, there are multiple pathways. I think, uh, Sergio, you, you addressed a lot of the ones that are on a structural level, for sure. Uh, so I won't go too deep into that, because I think that that's really important that an institution has those in place. And you illustrated that really nicely. Um, I, I think on individual levels, even though it's nice to be backed up by the structures in our workplace, uh, I think we really have to consider um, the responsibility that I have, that you have, that everyone can take in the workplace. And a lot of it does start with education. And it, it does start with educational programming that we can have in our organizations. So for example, through my work, we uh, go into different businesses and we, we do have workshops absolutely where we bring in new concepts that people can use in uh, their work to counter racism to to develop this anti-racist lens on what's going on in the organization uh, to have some tools but i also think that it's it's valuable to think about your room for action when you do have those tools so it takes some time to to even see racism for those of us who don't experience it directly on our body um, and i think 
taking on that educational path is one that's really important for the white people amongst us to uh, read books, talk to uh, our community, the friends that we have, uh, their thoughts, bring up the difficult questions, both to our friends who are people of color, but also to our white friends. Like, do you consider this? Do you think about what this is in your everyday and what do you do? Um, and as you develop your analysis, it's the thing that cannot be unseen because you start seeing it everywhere and you start noticing, okay, this is a form of regression that might not be the explicit, hey, exploitative, this is happening at the workplace, um, but it can be these microaggressions, the ways in which people can be excluded from conversations or from projects, small forms of power play or belittling that's not so explicit that you can file a complaint, but ways in which you can make a person feel like they do not belong. A good classic example, I think probably everyone here in the room is familiar with is asking someone where they're really, really, really from and really pushing on that question to emphasize that the answer that you're providing with the, providing me with isn't satisfying. I need you to explain an aspect of, of yourself that I don't really understand. And I feel like you owe it to me, therefore I will continue to ask you. Um, so that's just one thing that you can start noticing when you're in your workplace or in your community. But then what do you do when you notice this all around you? Obviously, uh, if you take on this anti-racist aspirational identity that you, you want to intervene in one way or another. And there are many ways to intervene when you see racism in the workplace and pathways towards that. Um, there's a, a great framework, it's called like the five Ds of intervention. It's great to Google. Um, and all the Ds represent actions that you can take after you've assessed the situation. So um, forms of, of racial aggression happens in so many different ways and you have to consider what is appropriate in ways to, to intervene. Sometimes it can be a question of safety. Sometimes you wanna consider what is the impact that I wanna achieve by intervening. Um, and sometimes you really have to consider who are the other people who are involved in this conversation as well or in this situation. So in, in one situation, it can be most useful to just distract someone from the situation. So if you see an aggressor toward, working towards another person with epithets or maybe even threats of violence and whatnot, you might be in a position to just distract them and say, hey, over here, or like, hey, your name's John, right? Uh, and really distract the aggressor or distract the whole situation by uh, directing um, attention towards yourself so that you do diffuse what's going on. Um, in another situation, you might be uh, the person that kind of loosens up the bystander effect. So many of you might know about the bystander effect. We see something horrible happening. Every one of us gets paralyzed. It's a very social phenomenon that we, we stop in our tracks and we just look at whatever's unfolding. Uh, and one of the things, the Ds that you can do in this situation is to delegate, that you can point at someone else in the room and say, Peter, <laughs> intervene, or Peter, do something, say something. And then you can snap people out of the situation, either if it's a person who you think is more capable of intervening than yourself, or just to, to uh, put more people into the situation of, wow, this needs an intervention, and maybe we can do it together if you do delegate. Another thing that you can do in the situation is that if you're not comfortable with intervening, you can document. So if a situation is going on um, that you get funky vibes from, it might not be explicit, it might not be clear what's actually going on, you can bring out your phone. I think most of us here now are probably got one hand on their phone right now, uh, and we do in most aspects of our lives. Record what is happening. Um, obviously, there are issues of consent with recording people, absolutely, but it can be really useful to have documentation of what is going on in a situation like that. And it can be really vital to a complaint that is made afterwards or to just have an overview of what's been going on in, in the workplace or in that social scene. Um, another D that you can do is uh, a delayed intervention. So you can check in with a person after the aggression has happened. Like, how are you doing? What do you need right now? Uh, that was messed up. I, I saw that this person was behaving really in a really bad way towards you. I didn't know what to say. Is there anything I can provide you with right now? So that you can check in with the person after the fact so that they do not feel alone in what's going on. Um, 
And then you can, of course, have a direct intervention. Like you can step in between the aggressor and the person who's receiving this uh, and say, stop, this is not okay. I'm putting myself here. Um, but obviously that's also complex. The person that you're stepping in to quote unquote protect or support might not want your protection or your support. Maybe they can handle it on their own. So there also has to be some sort of conversation or eye contact with that person of big eyes. Do you need this? How are you doing in this situation? Do you want me to come over? Um, but I think in most situations, actually entering the conversation, if you're unsure, is usually better than not doing anything at all to make the person feel like you are doing something. Um, yeah, so those are some pathways where I think you can intervene on a personal level with, with racism in the workplace mm -hmm. or, or work towards being actively against uh, the racism that's going on in the workplace, in addition mm -hmm. to all of these structural ways that Sergio pointed out through the policies that need to be in place and have consequences when violated. Awesome. Fantastic. Thank you so much. So many great practical examples there and uh, tips. That was fantastic. I really love the five D's and um, I loved the, you know, do the analysis, you know, consider safety, impact, who's involved. That's really vital, really key. And we all saw globally how one of those five D's documenting a situation actually made a huge difference for somebody that faced injustice we saw that globally so you might not be able to actively physically make a difference but doc documenting as we saw can be quite powerful that's just one of the five d's thank you so much for that sarah that was power packed and lots of information for us all there so chisholm i'm going to come to you now and um so I want to ask you, how can a workplace consider all the different inter intersectionalities present and still run effectively and get the income generating day to day activities accomplished? Thanks, Harrison. <laughs> um, so this is a pressing question. Um, I am reminded of a conversation I had with friends this summer. Uh, I was introducing them to the concept of intersectionality. Uh, one of my friends ask, uh, did ask me um, something to the effect of, you know, if people have various intersectionalities, how can we be aware of all of them in the workplace uh, and actually get the job done? It was a long and tedious conversation, <laughs> but a very important conversation. Um, so first, it is arguably very difficult to know the various intersectional identities of people employed at a company, especially when that company is large. If we take on the difficult and often very uncomfortable reality of addressing their intersectionality and corresponding oppression they face, how can we get any work done? I mean, the actual making, like money making and value creation goal of the company, how does it get done? So how can we ensure that they are all seen and valued as they are, so much so that they can execute the company's mission? Here's a very direct answer because I've been thinking about it since the summer. For any institution, company, leader, individual, that wants to be considerate of different intersectionality and still run effectively, when we make provisions for the people who are most marginalized, we eliminate barriers for everyone else. So that's the answer. It's just basically solving the challenges that the most marginalized people face in your organization, in your school, in your society, and that way, you find that you actually remove all the other barriers that a lot of other people face. So you don't have to learn all about your different intersectionalities and the complexity of it. You just have to kind of do a catch-all solving of the most marginalized groups. 
Okay, so kind of do an equitable review and see how you can best serve and best help all. I love that. That's that was really great. Fantastic. Thank you so much for your answer. How's everybody doing? How's all our participants still with us? Let me see. For those of you who have your cameras on, if you'd like to put your camera on, let me see you. Give it a little bit of a shake. Let me see some reactions, emoticons on there. Let me know that you're still with us. Yes. Hey, everybody that's putting on your cameras. Hi. Thank you so much. How interesting is this conversation today? I am loving it. It is powerful and fantastic. Thank you so much, guys. Loving your interaction. So I'm going to jump back in. And Sergio, now I'm going to come to you. Sitting looking all pretty and beautiful in the corner back there. Now it's time for you to take center stage. <laughs> so how is understanding our intersectional identities important to the progress of workplace DEIB initiatives? Yeah, so um, this is a really interesting one because uh, and I think it's a, it's a nice segue from from the uh, the last question and and what I you know I left in terms of walking the talk and um, and uh, you know the the first thing um, to think about here and when it comes to um, DEIB initiatives is um, realizing that this is a continuous work right this th these are not just things that you can take off a list and and then you're done then you can say well we're now we're 100 inclusive or now we're super diverse or you know um that it, it's it's realizing that and and again back to what i was saying in terms of when you get a more diverse workforce when you get a more when your organization gets more and more diverse then um these initiatives evolve and uh you, you target new groups you get new perspectives and uh and this is how you know, this is why, why I think this is a, a really important area of the organization that we're putting more focus on because it's this idea that if we only think about it as an HR thing or, oh, we're, I'm just going to take this course and then take it off, take it off my list. So I'm just going to do it because my manager said or, or uh, rather than understanding and back to, you know, our intersectional identities and seeing, well, this uh, might affect this person more than it does me, but then I also find, you know, when I break down my identity, I see that, well, in this, uh, this initiative speaks to me because I'm part of this group, but then, or see, okay, well, there's a team member, a new team member, let's say you have, um, this is something that, that I, I'm, I'm going to be working a lot um, in my role at SIPS that is thinking about the, uh, who else is in the team. So let's say if you have, um, you know, eight, people and they're all, you know, maybe the same background, the same race, the same gender, and then you get a new person joining the team. Um, and and then when when you see these DIB initiatives and um, hopefully you can realize, okay, well, this doesn't uh, affect me or concern me personally, but I have a team member who is, you know, black, brown, who's, you know, so, and, 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 and see, okay, how can I be a good ally for that person? How can I, what can I learn? Um, what, how can I impact the rest of the team who might not be as curious or as interested in, in these, um, these things as I am? Um, so, so this is something that I'm, I'm really, um, I'm really interested in, in hearing also at, at um, Chips that we have a new uh, DIB lead joining the company for the first, this, it's, it's a new role for the company joining in September. So I'm excited also to see how, because um, I'm going to be really, um, or, or want to, to collaborate with this person and see how, uh, you know, and engaging other parts of the organization and see how from a talent acquisition perspective, from, uh, you know, business sales, uh, how, how can this become Thing that people have in the back of their heads rather than again you know an item to check out the list yes definitely not a check not a check not a checkable list uh situation and i really like the the idea of making it um so ingrained and embedded in the organizational culture that individuals take on the responsibility of enforcing these policies and not leaving it up to leadership that definitely um <clears throat> So Chisholm, should we assess candidates, colleagues and companies as being racist or anti-racist based on what ideas they're expressing and what policies they're supporting and not what they're actually saying? Did you get that? Uh, should we assess them based on the things their actions, their actions, yeah, as opposed to what is, yeah, what they say. Okay. Yes. Um, 
Short answer, yes, absolutely. <laughs> uh, longer answer that is still quite short, actions speak louder than words. Where racism or anti-racism is concerned, and quite frankly, any diversity parameter is concerned. I'm not a mind Jedi. We're not mind Jedis. We don't know what you're thinking. I don't see what's in your heart. What I see is what you do. What I see is what you do not do. I see what you say and what you do not say, what you stand up for and what you don't. And in action speaks a thousand words, right? So yes, we have to, it was in Maya Angelou uh, uh, who said, if somebody shows you who they are, believe them. It was some fabulous woman that said it, you know? So, you know, so yes, we should assess candidates, friends, companies, colleagues, based on the ideas they put forward and the policies they do and do not support. What is in your heart is irrelevant when you're not standing up for what you believe. So when you do not stand up, that is your value. And I will judge you based on that value. And we should judge people based on that value. We should not cancel them, but we should call them and hold them accountable for the things that they do or not do. So, yeah. Absolutely. Um, we know how damaging it can be, or actually myself personally, just a, a personal example of that, for people who I see as leaders in the community, um, there was one particular leader that I have really loved and followed since 2013, who's been an integral part of my business building and my career. And this leader was supporting some really sketchy philosophies. And it kind of broke my heart because I thought the power that you have and that you carry um, and how you can influence people, you, you shouldn't take that responsibility lightly. And so I looked at the actions and thought, well, the words are not marrying up what they're professing from their mouth to be is not marrying up with their actions and what they're supporting. So we all see that. So I challenge each and every one of us, even on your social media, is are the things that you're supporting, liking, commenting on, actually reflecting who you say you are as an individual? Okay, so um, Sarah, as an in, from an individual perspective, uh, how can we become more aware of the hidden identities of ourselves and of others? Oh, that's a good one. Um... Well, let's start with the first part. How do we become more aware of the hidden identities of ourselves? I think, um, I mean, from this intersectional perspective, we can start digging out that we do have more identities, but a lot of us, we have a, a primary identity that we, we put down. Like if you put down on a piece of paper in front of you now, numbers one to five, and then you write down your identities. I think a lot of us are familiar with the first thing that we put down, whether it's uh, our gender or our race or our profession. Uh, we put down, there are certain things that we definitely know that I am about this. This is my political affiliation, for example. Uh, there's a Norwegian election coming up and I think a lot of people are like, okay, where do I belong in this spectrum? Um, so some of these things are, are really apparent to us. Some of these things are apparent to others. So I, I can see that Chisholm is a black woman uh, and the people around her can also identify that. I don't necessarily know how she identifies with her gender, or I don't know um, who she feels a sexual attraction towards. I don't know her, um, where she falls on this like neurodiverse spectrum. There are a lot of things about our identities that we, we can't see with a plain eye. Uh, and there are a lot of things that we don't necessarily consider with ourselves either. Um, so one of the exercises we do, um, in the consultancy work that I do at, at Catalyst, we do this uh, power flower or this uh, mapping exercise uh, where it's, it's a private exercise that you do for yourself, but it's a really good way to start the conversation in your own head and potentially with other colleagues. It's a, it's a worksheet that you can Google and you can find it online where you start mapping out different categories of identities. It's, uh, gender, race, religion, political affiliation, socioeconomic background, where in the city you live, the languages that you speak, your nationality, 
um, and so many different things that you can think about body type. Um, yeah, ability, etc. And within all of these categories, you map out what you see as or you know as the dominant identity in society and what you note as your identity. So for example, in my case, in the category of gender, I would say that uh, being male is the dominant identity in society, but my gender identity is female. So in these two cases, uh, my identity and the dominant identity do not map up. Um, and this, in this exercise, you, you kind of, you color in the, the petals of the leaf that do map up and you uh, color in different colors, the ones that don't match. Uh, but for example, in Norway, the racial identity that is dominant is white. So that's a ticky box for me, or that's something that I map onto the dominant identity. And it can be a really great awareness exercise for yourself in areas that you don't necessarily consider. So when I think about myself, I don't think strongly about being part of the upper middle class. And that's part of privilege, right? You, you don't consider that you do have it. Uh, but doing this exercise makes me aware of, oh, I fall here in the spectrum. And it can be a really good awareness for yourself that uh, when I map out myself, I can see the ways in which I belong to a dominant identity group in society and which ways I don't. It can make you more aware also of how you perceive other people. Um, and there are some of these things that it's okay to ask about straightforward. Uh, I think it's worthwhile considering why you want to ask people about their different identities of why you want to be aware of, of them. Like, do you need to know uh, the sexual preference of the people that you work with? Is that important to make your job flow? Uh, maybe it's an attempt to uh, be more inclusive that you feel like, oh, okay, this is a conversation I think we should be able to have. Uh, but then also to consider, is this a space where that person can feel comfortable sharing that information on their own account or on their own accord? And it's something that they can volunteer. And can I create that space for them? instead of asking them directly or demanding them directly. Also find that if people pose those questions to you and you don't feel ready to respond, it's a really nice response to be able to say, why do you ask? Um, which is not an aggressive response, I think, but I think it puts flips it back to the person who really has to think about, hmm, why do I wanna know where you're from or your parental background or your life situation with a partner? So yeah, I think there are ways in which we can map it in ourselves and also profit yeah. from others. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Sarah. I'm just curious mm -hmm. for all participants today, um, how many of you are actually in management or leadership position? If you just show with an emoticon on your screen. Um, I'm asking that question because I was curious, have you mapped out your intersectionality and how did you find, if you have, you know, how did you find that as an exercise? And if you haven't, I would challenge you to do that, because unless you understand it for yourself, then it's going to be really difficult to lead a team of people and understand it for others. Yeah. So before we move on, just let you know, we are now 55 minutes in. So we have about 35 minutes left of this session. Thank you so much. There's been a lot of questions coming in um in the chat which is fantastic if you have any other questions please throw them at us we're going to have a 30 minute question and answer session um at half past and uh, we will throw the hardest questions that you've got at us we will put our panelists to the test with the questions i've tried to come up with some tough hard hitting questions today but if you've got some harder hitting questions we're okay for those as well so now we're going to continue. And Sergio, I'm going to come to you. Um, <clears throat> what is the first step for anyone, even here, to take while striving to be an anti-racist? That's the first part of the question. So what's the first step for someone to take? Um, and how do we check ourselves and hold ourselves accountable if we notice somebody else being racist? Yeah, that's, uh, that's a good one. I feel like we could spend the rest of the session <laughs> on that, but, uh, but yeah, I'll try to keep it, keep it short. Um, uh, you know, in my, my opinion, the, the first, I'll start with the first part of the, of the question. And, you know, this, the first step, um, I believe is seeing this as, uh, you know, anti and seeing all these um, issues uh, related to, to this topic or, or the topic in general as a lifelong journey, I would say. Um, so, 
you know, in my case, this is something that I'm really, I'm really passionate about. I've been, I'm, I'm engaged and, and, and curious and, but, but I'm not, you know, I'm not sitting here with all the answers. Uh, nobody has all the answers, right? So, so by acknowledging and realizing this is something that is, you know, I'm going to be learning something new for the rest of my life. And, and, and you, you're going to be encountered with, with, uh, you know, be, be in situations where, uh, both, you know, yourself, but others might be uh, where, where you, you can challenge either what you've said or what other people have said or done. And, and, and I think it also takes away this daunting um, uh, idea of, of, well, now I have to go do a bunch of homework. I need to read a bunch of books. I need to do all this homework. And how am I going to, you know, what is this? Uh, how long is this going to take me? And it, it is this, so, so if you ask me, it's, it's this, the of, of the most important thing is being curious and 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 understanding that you know uh, it's okay to make mis mistakes along the way but it's about what you do with with those mistakes you take them as uh, learning opportunities um you know having the willingness to challenge what you know and in some situations it's because you haven't had exposure to you know people within a certain group or you haven't had uh, anybody nobody has challenged you or and and then so 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 it's this idea of of, of um, seeing this as yeah something that 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 but that, that also as well you need to invest in as as a person and and see think about how this can only it's not going to benefit uh, just me but the people around me and when it comes to holding holding people accountable one thing that I have noticed at least from my, from my own experience is that there is a, a time and a place and I'll um, mention in terms of especially when it comes to to the workplace and uh, let's say in situations where alcohol is involved for example you know um, work parties or uh, and and if you notice somebody saying or doing something uh, that you you know react to maybe something something racist instead of I mean I'm of the belief that it, the first step should be to analyze the situation and then if you know, if everybody has in, in the room has been drinking uh, or, or, you know, you don't really know the other person that well, so you don't know how to, they react under the influence of alcohol, for example, then uh, from my own experience, I've, 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 I find that it's been better to, to let it rest in the moment and then uh, find an opportunity the next week, for example, to bring that up um, just so that we're all in the same, you know, because um, I, I feel like then, at least from my own experience, I've, I've noticed that then the conversations that arise from that and the, the perspectives and the what the person and what I'm also I'm left with is 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 more substantial than than taking that and doing something about it in the moment where, you know, it might not be the best time or the best place to do that. Um, so uh, so yeah, I'm. Uh, I'll, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, okay, so Trudem, Sergio just mentioned uh, challenges. So what are some of the challenges or potential opportunities that may arise when someone starts realising their intersectionality and trying to embrace anti-racism? Um, well, I think there are many challenges that arise uh, uh, from intersectionality while working towards an actively anti-racist workplace. I, I I struggle sometimes, and you know my 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 team and my friends they know I struggle with just different layers. And sometimes, you know, the the negotiations that I feel like I have to make on the spot and make a decision because something happened and it's affected my various uh, 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 identities in vastly different ways. And I have to make a decision on the spot, like which identity should respond to this right now, you know? Um, and I think one of the things I try to remember is that the thing about privilege, I have privilege in so many rooms and I lack privilege in so many rooms, you know? Um, and sometimes they happen all in the same day. Um, but the challenges are endless, it is. Uh, um, but I think herein lies the opportunity. As I mentioned earlier, you know, by creating solutions for the most marginalized groups, you know, with their participation and quite frankly, leadership, you can remove barriers for everyone. Do not come up with solutions for the oppressed without the input of the oppressed. 
you know, get them in the room, listen and put policies and processes in place that are actionable and measurable. Don't just put a nice statement on your website or your handbook and say, you know, this is it. Like, what? Well, well, diverse, like diversity and inclusion is a, it's a catchphrase, it's a buzzword now. You know, actually put some muscle behind it. Um, because we know when you don't, you know, like if, sometimes, you know, when I, when I see companies or processes that claim to be diverse and you, you say, for example, a panel discussion or say an event that claims like, we're well, very diverse. And you look at that, you say, mm, yeah, I'm not blind. So this doesn't work, you know? So I think in terms of uh, 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 being anti-racist in the workplace, accepting as well with humility that you can't do it all and you cannot always get it right. But the people who have a lot to lose should be there when those solutions are created and when those decisions are made and they should be part and parcel of the implementation process as well. So it is challenging, but it's not impossible. Yeah, love that ending. Challenging, but not impossible. Very true. Um, okay, Sarah, <laughs> I'm gonna bear with me as I throw this at you, okay? So, there's a stronger and clearer correlation between levels of violent crime and unemployment levels. <clears throat> so, levels of violent crime, unemployment levels, and violent crime and race. Um, but that's not the story that policymakers have chosen to tell us. Okay, so why do you think this is? Why do you think um, policymakers focus on one particular area? Um, and how might our society and culture change if policymakers characterize dangerous immigrant neighborhoods as dangerous unemployed neighborhoods? Hope you understood all of that. Wow, that's a big question. Okay, let me rephrase it back to you uh, just to see if I understand. So explain why certain policymakers say that there's a larger correlation between race and crime than the actual unemployment and crime? Yes. Yes, okay. Uh, why do they do that? Oh man, I, uh, I mean, this is something that I come across in the narratives with a lot of the youth that I work with um, who are impacted by, by these narratives of a correlation between who they are and the situation that they're in instead of uh, a problem that they might have and the situation that they're in. I think um, that's an important distinction of, of like, what is the causal factor here? Um, race isn't a causal factor, it's correlated. Uh, unemployment, we can much rather see a strong ca causal factor towards crime. Absolutely. Um, I, I think it, this is not answering your question, but I think it's just really important to distinguish between um, saying that someone is the problem and has has a problem because you really limit a person when you describe them as a problem, um, especially when that description of a person as a problem goes along racial lines. It both legitimizes that narrative towards other people in society so that teachers might feel like it's okay to describe the youth in their class in this way. Um, as well as people on the street or whoever reads the newspaper. So I think it's, it's a really important thing to pay attention to and that we need to be critical of. That's the solution part that we'll come back to later. Why it is this way? I, I think uh, we have to consider who capitalizes on scapegoating people instead of structures. It's, I think it's easier to target people than structures. Structures are heavy to lift. I think it's more costly to solve unemployment than to, for example, arrest people. So, so a Norwegian example is uh, a local politician in Oslo who advocates for uh, more frequent stop and frisks of youth on the subway because uh, he argues that there is a higher correlation between youth of color and crime so that the police should have the right to stop and frisk. And, and we've seen from a North American context that obviously that that doesn't work and it has no negative repercussions of where these youth feel safe and where they wanna go and what they feel the city is for. 
uh, it doesn't reduce crime at all. It incites fear, um, but it's cheaper to put a few more police officers on the street in the short term um, to do this activity, even though the long term consequences of it, I think, are really, really expensive because it really limits people's life opportunities and ways that we don't quite comprehend when we allow for something like that. Um, I also think that people capitalize on, on saying that race is correlated to crime um, because it allows them to, to be tough on people instead of being tough on this abstract problem. So you can say, oh, we expect more from these people. Um, and I think that that has a really strong appeal in a society that benefits off of polarization. Um, to demonize others or to create others as a problem, I think is a really compelling political rhetorical move. Even though I don't support it, I think that it, you can really build support when you create an aggressor or someone who is the problem. And by uh, voting into office someone who is tough on that problem or tough on crime by uh, arresting people or creating more facilities for underage youth uh, who are engaged in crime, I think that you, you gain more traction with people who want to solve an issue that is best or that they think is best explained by simple factors of people being the problem instead of these larger structures in society. Mm. Um, the solution to it is, it, I don't think is easy. I think that, yeah, Sarif was saying here in the chat, populist strategies wins votes. I think that's, that's true. It's simple. And I, I think that the antidote to that, um, again, is education. I have an educator background, so I guess it's, it's part of why I lean towards those solutions. But I, I think we really need to expect of ourselves to be critical thinkers in so many ways. So to think about, yeah, who capitalizes on this narrative? Who is constructing this narrative? Um, and, and this is where we bring in, again, the intersectional dimensions, like the policymakers who are shaping this narrative, who are they affiliated with, both power-wise, but also identity-wise? Like, mm. Is this an old white man who's talking about the lives of young people? and making policies based on, on his lived experience, maybe we should make that narrative more complex. Do the youth have something to say in what they think is the best solution to reduce crime? Are they part of, of this? Or uh, do we allow someone who doesn't necessarily have access to that experience to shape both what it is and, and the solutions to it? So to think critically about that and to pose questions around that. And I think that that comes from uh, or that responsibility lays on us who read the papers and watch the television of what are the premises here for this argument? Like, do I accept that race is correlated with uh, crime? And, and what do I accept in that premise? And are there other ways to conceive this? And then I think, of course, journalists and other politicians have a large, large responsibility of countering those narratives and offering up other narratives to us as consumers of media, but especially to the people to, it can, to who it concerns, so that the young people that I work with can read in the newspaper other stories about themselves and to read narratives that represent who they are and their experiences as well. So yeah. critical thinking uh, and action, I think, is a good way to have an anti-racist bent to, to the problem that you described. Great, thank you. And I know this is not a political <laughs> debate or conversation, uh, but I just asked that question because, you know, what we see in the wider context of society and community is what we perpetuate in a smaller context within our workplaces because it's that popular uh, populist idea. So mm -hmm. leading on from that, Sergio, uh, what is groupthink and how does that exacerbate racist microaggressions? Yeah. So um, first of all, so so group thing is the group thing. Sorry, is when um, you know either a perspective or idea within a group uh, goes unchallenged uh, for the sake of of consensus. Right. It's something that we're all all agree. There might be somebody who who has a contrary or opposing idea, but then it seems like everybody is. You know, school with uh, agrees with what is what is being planned, and that might lead certain situation may, situations, maybe flawed decisions, and 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 so on. Um, one thing that uh, you know, where microaggressions come in um, here is that um, uh, you know they're called that for for a reason, right? So so there they can be 
really subtle. They can go unnoticed. Uh, they, they can be a they can be a common, um, you know, something that in a group or it's a society, something that you know people don't really don't really challenge, and that just kind of stays. They just um, stay like that without without any anything being made. And one example that I would like to give when it comes to racist my, microaggressions is. Um, something that I've experienced uh, 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 personally, and is when people dismiss other people's names because they're unfamiliar uh, to them, right? So I um, I had just recently uh, last week I met somebody for the first time, and uh, they introduced themselves, and I said, you know, my name is Sergio, and they looked at me and this, you know, kind of like didn't quite catch what I said, so I repeated, you know, Sergio, uh, and then they. You know, they, they kind of shook their head and just, you know, didn't even try pronouncing my name or just kind of like this with this dismissive gesture. And there are two things here. You know, one of them is I don't expect people to say my name exactly like I do, especially, you know, in, in countries or, or languages where it might be it might be difficult for people to 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 pronounce my name correctly. But it's the way that people approach that. Right. It's it's the way of you know, th this is so much more than just a name or so much more than, than just, uh, and, and as, as a, as a uh, something that I did to, to, to kind of, um, you know, as I result is that the first couple of years that I lived in Norway, I went by my middle name, no, I changed names after I got married, but I went by Daniel. So I was like, well, it's, it's just much more, much easier. Like people will get it. Uh, and then after a couple of years, I was like, no, you know what? I, I love my name. It's like, here, that's what, you know, and, and, and what, and then I started exploring these thoughts because I didn't, before I didn't really give it that much thought, uh, but I've experienced that it's quite a, you know, in terms of group think it's quite more like, oh, well you, oh, I can't pronounce this. I'm not even gonna try or like, oh, well, I've never heard that name. So whatever. And, 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 and why does that, you know, why is this important? And one reason obviously from, from my, from a um, talent acquisition perspective is that this is about uh, one thing is you know name bias in recruitment practices, right? We if if we get candidates with um, uh, you know that and there's been a lot of research done on on you know Anglo sounding. Uh, you know, and then you have two candidates who might be equally qualified, but then we go with the option. Well, I can't pronounce that name, so I'm going to go with that person, or oh, I'm familiar with uh, with that. Uh, and and uh, so this is when when these microaggressions become. You know, if if we take a step back and we look at the bigger picture, th this is not just somebody being like, oh, I'm not going to say, or uh, you know, uh, or or for fear of butchering my name or 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 something like that. It's something about what does that it creates an automatic distance between the person because uh, i after this this instance last week i was left with this you know well you kind of on on unease and 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 this uh, and that was the first impression right meeting that person and being well i can uh, you know i can uh, say names like and you know the least you could do is do me the courtesy of at least trying to pronounce my name correctly I'm smiling because of your example with the name. So you can imagine with a name like Hyacinth and living in six countries, some of the microaggressions I faced due to my name. Um, okay, so we have 15 minutes left of this section and I'm really loving uh, the answers from the panelists and I'm getting lost basking in, in all of these answers. Um, I'm going to ask one more individual question, and it's going to be from Chisholm, and then I'm going to end it how I always love to end this section, which is by asking the panellists to give us their top three tips and their top three takeaways. So you've got practical, helpful advice to walk away with. So Chisholm, Kendi believes that we can heal society of racism, that we can defy odds, and create an anti-racist society. So first of all, do you agree with that? And why do you think that hope is so central to the anti-racist movement? I'm, I'm thinking, why is hope substantial? So central, so central to the anti-racist Central movement. to the anti-racist movement. Yeah. Okay. Full disclosure right now, um, I have had a pretty rough couple of days. I'm exhausted. I haven't slept. Um, but I'm going to share a story, um, a personal one. So 
indulge me. Um, on a Saturday, uh, the 24th of July, 2021, I was at a picturesque holiday cabin owned by a friend, approximately an hour and a half away from Oslo. It was my first time there. I was with my 21 month old daughter, my husband and three other people. It was a gorgeous afternoon. So I decided to go for a 20 minute run because yeah, the plan was to run 10 minutes one direction and 10 minutes back as I normally do on most days. Now I also had to negotiate that it was a semi remote location unknown to me. And I was aware that I am both a woman and black. So I figured I'd run two minutes one way and two minutes back because I wanted to be close enough to the cabin. The plan was to do this until I hit my 20 minutes run. The road was big enough to fit two cars, but it wasn't a major road. Whew, um, it was a typical run. Some cars passed by while I, while I ran. Towards uh, the end of my run on my way back, I noticed the car coming behind me. The closer I got to me, the faster I'd sped up, so much so that it ran me off the road. And by the time the car reached me, I ran into the edge of the forest. The person on the passenger side of the car rolled down their window, yelled out the N word and gave me the finger as they drove away. A million thoughts ran through my head in that moment, you know, and the loudest thought was to get back as fast as I could to my daughter, my husband, and the safety of the cabin. By the time I got to the cabin, my, my heart was pounding. I felt so much fear, I could smell it. I felt helpless and even worse, I felt shame. I was ashamed. My crime, running while black. I cried most of the afternoon, trying to reconcile or rationalize why. Oh, why it happened to me? Why did it happen? Everyone at the cabin was horrified at my experience. Some suggested I report to the police, you know, but I didn't feel up to rehashing the trauma to a white audience of police, women and men who no doubt be horrified and likely remind me that those people were just ignorant. And quite frankly, I just, I didn't want to be another unactionable un statistics. The experience stays with me to this day, and I do my best to block it out when it resurfaces. There's something about feeling that kind of fear, the type that reduces you to less than human, to dust. You feel unsafe, insignificant, and worthless. And you know that when you live in my skin, that someone, a stranger might perform a violent act against you or even take your life and get away with it just because they can. Because the system and the structures are rigged against people like you. And as I mull it over, you know, I find myself in a resting state of rage, fury. <laughs> This is a special dose of all consuming pain and helplessness that I wouldn't wish on the worst human on earth and not even my oppressors. This is a type of pain I don't want my daughter to know, experience or even have to navigate because it violently chips away at your soul. So to answer your question, Hyacinth, I, I have to believe that society can heal of racism, that we can all become anti-racist, that we can all defy odds. I have to believe this. I, I need to believe this. I am trying 
to believe this because based on my experience, I keep thinking that this pain must mean something to me and I have to respond. And in my mind, it's very clear. There are two routes. There are two routes I see, violence or hope. You should pray, I choose hope. So yeah. Wow. Thank you for sharing that, Chisholm. Oh, gosh. Very emotional. I struggled myself to even keep composed, to remain composed. Um, yeah, and in that we can all feel the power of um, what each experience means or the effect that it has on an individual and uh, really and truly there's got to be hope there's got to be it's hope that's that's kept us alive it's hope I know for us as a race of people it's only because of hope why we're still going and so I, I agree with Chisholm that you know all we can do is hold on to hope that we can collectively actively work towards bringing change. Thank you so much, Chisholm. Uh, before we go to the Q&A section, I'm going to ask all the panelists, and Chisholm, you can just compose yourself. Um, what are your three top tips for becoming anti-racist and being inclusive of various intersectionalities? So Sarah, could I start with you? Your three top tips for becoming anti-racist and be being more inclusive of intersectionalities, others intersectionalities. Yeah, I um, just want to say thank you, Chisholm, for, for sharing that, um, being vulnerable and letting us be in that with you. Um, feels a bit trite to come with top three tips uh, on something like that uh, or following something like that. Um, but I think this conversation has given me multiple things to, to want to pursue going ahead. And I, I do want to share that with all of you. Um, I think the first thing uh, is, is to keep on learning and to take responsibility for that learning about you can start with your identities uh, within yourself, within your community. Just know what are the different manifestations of identity that impact us in our life. Really try to figure out what is, is this thing called intersectionality. Um, I think the second thing that um, I want to practice and I, I have as a tip is to notice and reflect upon when you speak up and when you shut up. Um, what are the things that prompt you in, in either act? Do you speak up and take up space on, at the cost of someone else? And are you silent when it behooves you uh, and others have to pay that cost? And then as a consequence of getting to know your different identities, including what your, your privileges are, uh, and perhaps all the ways, the ways as well in which uh, you experience different forms of oppression. Um, consider honestly how you can give your time and resources towards an anti-racist pursuit. What, what can you afford if you're honest with yourself? When, when do you have the capacity? Uh, and when do you have more capacity than someone else. Not just, do I feel like it today, but who should speak up here today? Yeah. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Now, Sergio, your three top tips. Yeah, thank you. Uh, both Tissom and, and Sarah for, for some uh, really good, good tips already, but uh, I'll, um, there probably gonna be some, some overlap here, uh, but, uh, but I'll start with, um my first tip and and this is this was my my first question and um uh, really something that i'm um i believe is key here is is becoming 
more aware of how we enter different spaces, right? Who, I want to bring it back to the concept of spaces. So who is in that space with us? Who is not represented in that space? And um, it's, it's especially when, when it comes to, to, to intersectionality, if we, in my case, I can say, you know, I'm uh, um, a gay Latino, right? So two minorities here, but then I'm also uh, a cisgender man uh, with no disabilities. Um, so, so that also comes with is, you know, so dominant groups and privileges. So, so understanding and, and, and balancing, um, again, you know, take, taking a step back and looking at the situations from an outsider's perspective and seeing, okay, which voices are not represented and which voices can I amplify? Um, another thing, uh, which, you know, we uh, wish we would have more more time to talk about, but it, it'll be for another time. Is is to to recognize our unconscious biases. Um, I think this this is a topic that um, you know <clears throat> by acknowledging that you know we all have them, and and that uh, rather than 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 trying to um, uh, to kind of convince ourselves or convince others that that you know. My, you know, my biases, those are or non-existent or, but, but I think when it comes to unconscious bias is about um, challenging them both in ourselves, uh, but also in others. And um, again, you know, recognizing that not everybody, when, when it comes to this journey, people are in different steps of this journey or different, different uh, um, stages. And, um, and if you see the opportunity to, you know, challenge somebody else um, and, and, and you see again, you know, Deal the situation and and the the space is right. Then, you know, when you maybe you have been in that situation before and somebody has challenged you earlier. Yeah. So um, so those are the first two, and then the last one would be, you know, adopting this um, you know lifelong learner mindset. Um, so so you know if that curiosity comes from you, um, not uh, not expecting other people to do our homework for us. Uh, I think that's an important and, and realize I think Sarah was was saying we're talking about capacity and 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 also recognizing that people might have um, you know not not everybody in every situation is up to or or has the uh, you know the capacity mental capacity emotional capacity to to have you know conversations or or to 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 um, um, you know show you in a perspective that you know in some situations it should also be our own. Um, uh, our own response again. Sorry, we're saying taking our uh, responsibility and uh, yeah, being being curious. So mm. great, thank you so much, Sergio. Um, now, Chisholm, it's your turn. Um, but I of course want to extend grace to you after that emotional share. Do you feel up to sharing your top three tips? Sure. Okay. Thank you. Um, quickly, just want to say thank you to everyone I've received bunch of direct messages uh probably can't get to all of them but thank you um top tips uh i think sergio touched on the third one and uh, i i just want to provide a little bit more context uh, uh uh with my first one uh do the work explore what you were in taught in school there are books documentaries google is your friend learn about the historical enslavement of black people and the colonization and genocide of native and indigenous people. The historical and ongoing violence has impressed power for white people and institutional structures. Call out white supremacy and white privilege. Two, empathize with the lived experience of racism. I feel a bit silly saying that after just sharing my experience, but okay. <laughs> Explore the importance of people's experiences from an intersectional, social, cultural, political, and institutional perspective, and the impact it has on them, their communities, and their future generations. The third tip is reflect and check your language and assumption. What does equality really mean to you? Do you really see all people as equal? Be critical about the motivations of social and political institutions and systems, for example, the healthcare sector or academia. Recognize their roles in allowing and upholding oppression on a basis of identity. Like Sarah said, you know, the next time you feel like ask, asking someone, where are you really from? Even though you were just curious and you mean no harm, remember that that person 
receives that question with so much frequency that it compounds their feeling of being different and not belonging and try to understand that many social, political, and economic issues affecting all groups that have been historically marginalized are rooted in institutional structures that have been empowered by centuries and centuries of prejudice and bigotry. So those are my top three tips. Wonderful, thank you so much and bang on time. So, oh my gosh, how exciting and how wonderful has this been, this discussion. And thank you so much to our panelists. You have been super fantastic with um, the value that you've already provided for us. And now it's time to come to our beautiful audience to engage you even more and to start answering some of your questions. Um, we do have some questions already in the chat, but if you do have any other questions, please feel free to, free to add them and hopefully we'll try and get through them as quickly as possible. Um, so I'm going to start with this question. I will throw it out to the panelists. And what I will say is um, for the person, the per when somebody's answering, I'll ask the other two panelists to quickly scan through the questions to answer the next question as we go along, just so that we can speed up for time purposes. So Anantha asked, is intergroup prejudice in multi-ethnic settings racism? Sarah. You want a white girl to answer that? <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, I think you can consider racism as, as uh, a hierarchy of, of blackness to, to whiteness, that it is a function that, that elevates whiteness. And I think that that can work within uh, people, groups with people of color as well, um, that you can express uh, discrimination against uh, another person who has a similar skin color to you. Um, I think that uh, when you have the addition of an anti-blackness in that discrimination, then that becomes racism that is interacted between people. And I think that it can be internalized. Um, so I, I think that that can be present, um, but I really don't want to be the authority on this answer as well. Um, Okay. That's, that's my take on it. All right, yeah. thank you so much. I'm just going to plow through the questions because there's quite a lot of them. So mm -hmm. thank you so much for your answer, Sarah. Uh, Sergio, this was a direct question to yourself. From a talent acquisition perspective, are there any initiatives you'd like to see at every company that wants to make DIEB not just a tick box for everyone working there? Um, and she says, I've been focusing on mentorship and skill building for minority groups, but it never feels like enough. This is a really good question. Um, and uh, I'm definitely, I feel like this, this is something that I'm absolutely, I, I would like to learn more, more about. I have some ideas, but, but yeah, it's definitely something that I, I think uh, is key in, in terms of, um, you know, it's back to what we were saying, you know, progress and DIB initiatives. But one thing that I'm, that, that I think is, uh, well, it's, it's a two part answer. So the, the first part is that to, is to make sure that um, when it comes to DIB initiatives and the message and, and the, the motivation um, to make sure that, um, we, we focus on people first and foremost and not profit. And I'll, I'll say what, what I mean by that is, is that I, I get a feeling that, um, you know, these past few years that, you know, more DIB um, uh, topics, initiatives, uh, companies are, are focusing more on, D, you know, index, uh, quality index and all these things. Um, I see a lot of, you know, this narrative of, uh, you know, diverse teams are profitable or, um, you know, uh, Profit on uh, diversity, and 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 that um, you know obviously that's uh, you know a, a positive business results that that that's something you know that's a good thing. Don't get me wrong, but when when that becomes the main motivator, and we don't and we put put too much focus on that rather than seeing this as a you know people topic first and foremost, then I think that's when we we see that. Um, uh, and, then, and then it becomes a lot of, at least in my, my impression, you know, empty talk or very, um, 
very, very up here uh, on the surface. So, so by focusing on people and, and trying, you know, in every single initiative, workshops, uh, courses to make it as personal as possible um, and, and use, you know, examples, lived experiences, people's uh, stories. I feel, you know, I believe that stories are uh, much more powerful than, than, you know, if you give people a lot of, you know, theory and, and, and concepts and, and this and that, then, then it might not, then again, it, we might go back to just that, you know, tick of, tick of a box thing. But if we give people, and especially in, in smaller arenas, let's say just you and your team, for example, rather than like a company-wide um, uh, initiative, if we, if we make it personal and, and, and smaller scale, then I think we'll get people to, you know, we'll make some progress and, and get more people to think about it as a, and see themselves as part of it and rather than, than just something that they need to get, get through and get over to the next, next task. Nice. You unmute, I think. Oh, sorry, sorry. I thought I unmuted. Um, thank you so much for that, Sergio. Chisholm, uh, Tende asks, is hope enough? It's a start. I mean, hope without action and processes does not work. Um, yeah, but it's it's a start. I feel that if we lose hope, then what do we have? You know, why do we do this work? Why why do I organize this session every month? Hope creates change. It it, it makes a difference and yeah, I think, unfortunately, sometimes the people who are oppressed are often the people who have to do the work and carry that baggage. Um, but for me, I need hope. I, I don't have anything else because, you know, uh, uh, um, I have a personal stake in it. I, I think I'm quite tough and I can handle a lot, no matter how, how, how rough it is. Um, but I have a child who's Black and I just can't imagine a world in which she can't go to certain parts of the country because someone might try to kill her or she doesn't get opportunities because her name is not Norwegian sounding. You know, I have to hope and that hope is oftentimes fueled by anger and rage, but I have to use it for good because there's too much at stake for me. And I, I want to make sure that, you know, in, in, in 18 years, if, if I can't protect my child from this and, and she, she comes home and says, mom, this happened. I honestly just want to say, I tried. I did something. So I think I think we have to have hope and I think that's what pushes us. So whether you're black, brown, white, uh, um, I, th I think it's important that you hope that even though, cause there's a question on here about being afraid of backlash, you have to hope that you're getting through that if one person changes the way they think, don't just think about that as one person. That's an entire generation that is affected because of what you did, because of the fact that you spoke up. So hope is not enough, but it's a solid foundation. Great, thank you so much, Chisholm. Uh, Sarifa asked, and I hope I've, um, I'm, asked, I'm asking this correctly, Sarifa, how do we guard against the tendency of the white hero syndrome, which she, she says can be so prevalent in Norway, because in anti-racism movement, it can be counterintuitive. So people that are super excited, but become pushy, um, this is not something that can be imposed. So how do we how do we guard against the tendency of the white hero syndrome? I have a few thoughts. 
I think it's Go a ahead, really sir. important uh, question. Miriam and Tendai also uh, brought up similar questions because uh, it is prevalent in this field. And I think the people who profit the most in this, the field of DEI be still uh, are definitely white people, like the highly educated white men and women, for sure. Um, I think that's worth pointing out. Um, I think the people who are engaged in this field have to ask themselves why they are. I, I think, like, honest disclosure, I think I work through my unresolved trauma in ways by assuming association with other traumas that are more clearly articulated for me. That is part of why I engage in this. I think that's saying something else would be lying, but I obviously hope that my solidarity and, and aspirations for that is part of it too. Um, and then I think it's really important to consider what, what space do you take up as a white person in this? How can you better use your position to give space to someone else? Yeah, who has agency in these conversations? Thank you. Um, and this is not a question, it's a comment from Sayonara, but it's regarding when you was talking earlier about the systems and she said the system creates the problem and then sells solutions for the same problem that it created. <laughs> Nice one, Sayonara. Um, okay, so um, actually, I'm going to ask this question because Sarifa then says, what's in a name? And I want to ask that question because for some people, a name doesn't mean anything, but for others, a name has a lot of meaning. So what is in a name? Actually, Chisholm, I'd maybe like you to answer that question. I was thinking that Sergio should answer this question because <laughs> he was okay. talking about his yeah, but name. I, <laughs> but I would also like to hear your, your perspective. Just something I can add some something at the end of that one. Yeah. Okay. Um, oh, I think there's a lot of identity in, in, in the name. Um, there's a lot of culture in that name. And I think there is an acknowledgement when we try to pronounce those difficult names that are not really difficult because we just need to try. It's an acknowledgement that I see you as you are, you beautiful, perfect being. I think for me, there is culture, you know, I named my, my child, my daughter has uh, a Nigerian name, a Igbo name specifically. It means God's grace. Where I'm from, at least as my mom told me, the name you give your child is the first prayer you send them into the world with. And that name follows them for the rest of their lives. Is it easy to call my child Mary because it's more acceptable across the whole world? Absolutely. But I don't get to bless her with a prayer that my ancestors, like continuing a tradition that my ancestors have practiced before me. So I think there is just, there is a, pers a person in a name and there are cultures and traditions and values therein. Sergio, your turn. <laughs> Not bad. That's um, a lot of the, you know, the thoughts that I that I had as well, and and I think you know for me it's also this this idea of of uh, it's a way of opposing and and you know challenging the the, the status quo, challenging. Um, as I said, you know, with, from my own experience, I've had a lot of. Uh, uh, you know, at different periods of, and that, especially that period where I decided to go by a different name because I thought, well, that's the easy, um, the easy way out or, or the, 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 it'll be easier for other people or it'll be, you know, and, and it's, it's also a way to think about yourself, what is important to you, what it, what is, um, and, and why, and, and, and standing, you know, being, um, uh, Standing for 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 that, uh, um, um, knowing what you stand for, sorry, in, in terms of you know why why I'm doing it, and maybe you know other people might not see it, but um, uh, but yeah, if you if that if that's important to you, and it's a way of showing that you know what this is, it's part of my identity, and and it shows that we you know again when we talk, when we talk about 
diversity and, and show that rather than trying to fit into this box or trying to, to assimilate or trying to, I'm going to be like them. It's like, no, I'm going to be myself and, and, and show the value in that. Great, thank you. Uh, we have 15 minutes left powering through the questions. Um, George says, the issue of challenging and intervening in racist issues or other issues that we all hope to end is a fear of backlash. Have any of the panel experienced this or do you have any tips? Mark. Yeah, uh, I think I can speak to the fear of backlash that has kept me quiet in way too many situations than I want to admit. Um, I think it could be a, an instinctual reaction at first and then you can choose how you want to respond after that. But I think that to both give yourself room for that, but to put the onus on yourself to, to act in that. I like, um, there's a term called foot and mouth disease that I like. I think we all suffer from it. And I think the moment we accept that, we also carry the backlash more readily uh, in a position of privilege that I carry in most situations because I'm white. I think the backlash that comes towards your career promotion or housing safety, et cetera, uh, if you do speak up in other situations, require different forms of considerations. And I'd love to add to that as well. In my country, um, being gay is punishable by 12 years in prison. Just think about that, being who you are. You get to go to jail. That is if you get to jail. Some people get killed, jungle justice, before they even make it to a prison. And it's not a popular topic. I know my gay friends who pretend and live false lives. They marry because they want to survive. They want to live. And every time I'm back home and the topic comes up, and sometimes I just bring it up, it is terrifying to carry an unpopular opinion. And one like that where even the support of gay people is frowned on, upon. But, you know, I've learned in my life and over many experiences of not speaking up, of being afraid, of wanting to belong, even in the face of something that defied every bit of my value system, that it's easier to forgive myself for the things I say and for the actions I take than for the ones I do not. So we all have that fear. Uh, 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 so I, I think, I guess what I wanna say, you know, is we have that fear, it's a constant thing. And being anti-racist, for example, is a constant fight and decision to speak up and be unpopular and be uncool and sometimes face a lot of backlash. But at the end of the day, at least for me, I need to be able to sleep at night. So that is how I navigate that challenge. Okay, thank you so much. Um, Miriam posed the question and Miriam says, um, how, might, how might we move away from upper class, white, highly educated men and women who are leading cultural arenas and engaging in dialogue around racism, um, inviting minorities to come speak? I think, how might we move away from the upper class, um, white, highly educated, invite minorities to come and speak, but they're not actually making any strides in giving a voice and or power to local minority communities. It wasn't quite a question posed, but I think the question is how do we move away and how do we give a voice to local minority communities? What do you think, Sergio? I'd like to hear your thought on this one. Yeah, a lot of uh, different thoughts running right into my head now, um, but, I, you know, one thing that I think is important when, when, when it comes to, um, you know, this question is being more critical about what arenas we, you know, where we participate or who is behind 
certain, you know, um, certain arenas, certain events, certain, um, in, instead of, you know, just showing up for, for, for the sake of um, diversity or for the sake of being, being a little bit more critical and say, okay, if the person behind this is if I experience or people around me experience that they're not in it for the, or for the right reasons or they're not really amplifying the voices that should be amplified, maybe we should, you know, take initiative and go with it or, you know, either, um, you know, thank, uh, say, say uh, you know, politely, like I'm, I'm not gonna, I'm not going to, um, to participate in this event and find another where we can actually, where you can see that the, the people behind it and the meaning behind it is more, um, is for the, for the right, for the people that should be, uh, those voices should be amplified for. Uh, I, yeah, um, Absolutely. I'm gonna leave it at that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, I would just add to that. Um, why don't we challenge, challenge um people, challenge organizations. If you see events that are happening, why not challenge the event organizers and say, hello, where's the representation here? You're talking about this topic, but you're not actually being representative. Challenge them. So Sam Jones says, as a non-leader, what is the best way to create a safe space for our co-workers to be able to mention and and work through microaggressions and subtle acts of exclusion. So what's the best way to create a safe space for our co-workers to be able to mention and work through microaggressions and subtle acts of exclusion? Um, I can start from that. Um, I think listen to them. And you don't necessarily need to come up with a solution but listen to them because they know. I don't know how many people here, maybe if you're of color or if you uh, are gay, you, you, you know the difference when, for example, people look at you. Like it doesn't always have to be like a violent act or like, a, 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 you know, it doesn't have to be that. But you know, sometimes when you say, oh, I, okay, I, I can share a story here. I remember being on the train uh, once with my husband who's a white man um and uh, uh i said oh they're looking at us they're giving us the look and he goes um but they probably just think you're pretty and i thought oh but i know the difference you know it's not in my head and i think sometimes we mean well and we know that you know, or other, we assume that other people mean well, but when you tell us, or when you tell marginalized groups, when you question what they know for a fact, you gaslight them, you tone police them, you make it difficult for them to speak up next time because they're just like, you wanna create a safe environment for me, but you don't actually listen to me. So I think listening is the first step. And when it comes to solution, involve them in what do you actually need? Everyone is different. And I think oftentimes people make uh, the mistake of assuming that all minority groups are the same. Oh, Chisum is a black woman, so she must know exactly what hyacinths need. So if I provide for Chisum, hyacinth should be good. That is not always the case. So listen to the specific person and ask questions. Uh, and I think this is something Sarah is quite good at. I think it's always okay to put your foot in the mouth and just say like, this might sound wrong, but I need to ask, you know, what can I do? What do you need? Ask, don't make assumptions. I guess I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Chisholm. Uh, Tendai, Tendai says, I struggle to say white privilege and white supremacy because the syntax and choice of words is derogatory for the listening ear. What else can be said here? Sarah. Oh, I think it's a tricky one. Sorry, before you start, we have six minutes. So I'm going to ask you to be quicker than a minute so we can move to the next question. Oof. I, I don't have the solution. I think it's a great question. I, I think the term white supremacy places or names the origin of the violence. And I think that that's an important part of the term. Um, calling it supremacy, I, or I don't, I don't know, uh, Tendai, uh, the part of the word that um, 
you have a grievance with, but I imagine it's the white part that if we can conceptualize it in a different way, um, please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but I think it's important to be able to name it, uh, but other words to call it supremacy and to understand that that is tied into whiteness. I see you thinking. Please engage. Yeah, other people, if you have responses on that too. Yeah, please, if anyone else has got an answer. Oh, yeah. sorry, Sergio. I was going to say, if anyone else has an answer to that, would you mind putting it in the chat? Because I would like to move to the next question. Um, so, Mary has a question around white passing on non visible ethnic minorities. So, she says in Norway, for example, they have the Sami, Romani, and Jewish people, and they may not be visible unless they out themselves. How do we safely involve these groups to participate in dialogues around racism in the workplace and the wider community? It's a really good question. <laughs> um, and uh, I'll, I don't know if um, any of the others, I, I feel like I, I don't have, um, I, I, here I would like to hear some, you know, somebody else's perspective actually. Um, but uh, but just as a quick thought, or my, my instant thought is um, making sure that, you know, um, spaces and and you know that these conversations are that are um one thing is that there's no you know one size fits all or not one you know um that, that people experience you know discrimination in different ways and so obviously white passing communities it's it's that's a whole nother topic i feel now in three minutes i'm not gonna be able to go into but but it's this idea of like expanding the conversation so that there's space for these perspectives as well and see what kind of similarities and overlaps are between you know different communities either you know black brown white passing but they're all part of ethnic minor, minorities intersectionality baby yeah <laughs> that's it if i can add quickly there i think like with white passing like you also have to think about it as proximity to whiteness and it doesn't just happen in countries like Norway, where you have white people and, you know, black people and brown people and all of that. But even in predominantly black countries, say in African countries, you know, where colorism is a thing, because the lighter you are, the more privilege you have, the more beautiful, you know, uh, people perceive you to be, uh, uh, and the more access you have on a cultural, institutional and social basis. So, yeah, it's, uh, I think it's a whole new DEI conversation <laughs> on its on its own. Awesome, thank you. So we are now, the time is now 14.58. So we don't really have time for any more questions. Um, Emma, I'd just like to say, Emma said that she's heard the term white arrogance used instead of white supremacy. So maybe that's a, a suggestion for you there, Tende. Um, thank you so much to our panelists, thank you, Sarah, thank you, Sergio, thank you, Chisholm. You have been phenomenal today. Thank you to our amazing participants. You guys have been off the charts and the questions are still coming through. I'd just like to say that um, all resources that have been mentioned today will be sent out to you. We will send a follow-up email, just giving you all the resources that have been mentioned. And panelists, in case you didn't know, that's time for you to start writing it down. Um, and yes, yeah, so we will send you a follow-up email. The team from Diversify will let you know the next uh, DNI um, conversation will be in September and it is the last Wednesday in September. Does somebody have the date for me? I wasn't prepared. I didn't bring the date. Uh, but it's the last Wednesday in I think September. The 29th, maybe. Okay, thank you. Um, so we will send you the information for that. Uh, just also like to say, if anybody is in need, any of your companies in need of any diversity and in inclusion training, then please contact Diversify. They have very thorough training. And as you can tell, just from these free events, you know, the quality and of the content that you'll be receiving is off the charts. So thank you all today for attending. Um, could you just put your cameras on and we'll just all say a collective goodbye and wave everybody.